Hello everyone. In this video, we will continue with our marketing fundamentals series. So if you haven't watched the previous videos, please, you know, subscribe to my channel and then watch other videos before coming to this one, because in this one, we will start talking about how you can influence your customers without forcing them. All right. Because we, we know that with the general psychology, you can influence your customer with like punishments or uh, some reward mechanisms. In this one, we will use none of those, but we will influence their behavior without forcing them. All right. So, uh, and this is actually falling under behavioral economics concept. And there are several people who won Nobel Economy Prize uh, because of their contribution in this field. All right. So, this is a very popular area. And in this video, I'm going to introduce this one uh, very briefly to you. Okay. So, who should we reach and how we can convince them by using irrational behavior of consumers right so we, we know that we already covered this in the previous video we know that consumers are not rational all the time they are not making decisions based on the data available but they are easily influenced by some maybe simple factors or you know some simple things affect their behavior so just to introduce the concept to understand why we cannot be irrational all the time so i just like to introduce this cognitive overload concept to you with like showing two uh two of the richest uh, people in the world actually one of them is not with us anymore so but i'm sure you know about why steve jobs was wearing this uh, turtleneck jumper and then the blue jean all the time when he attended lunch meeting or new product launch, uh, the, the, the conference, news conference. And sometimes you see Zuckerberg is also doing something like that, but right now, so he wears something like uh, more in line with the color of the, the Facebook, actually Meta now, the brand, brand logo colors. But why do they wear those instead of having, you know, some fashion advisors telling them what to wear, and then give them some designer clothes or suits and everything, right? They have the money, but they don't do it. Why? Because they don't want to use their cognitive resources for the simple choices, right? Because what to wear, even if it is not that critical for them, because they want to use their resources for later uh, time of the day, and when they have like a very critical business decisions, they want to have a fair mind and then resources for that. But even if they think that oh, it's a simple decision, let me check. But when you open your closet door in the morning and then look at all the choices or someone tells you like, oh, today, this is the combination that I suggest to you. If you don't like it and if you suggest something, your brain still use your cognitive resources. So we have limited resources and uh, to make rational choices. And on top of that, there are stress factors, tiredness, and too many decisions decisions like what to eat in the morning or what to wear today and everything still use your cognitive capacity and a later time of the day you have this information paralysis so normally our brain like physiologically our brain doesn't know what is tiredness right so our brain doesn't get tired but mentally you have this feeling that information paralysis that you don't want to work like you don't understand anything and this is what called cognitive overload why this is critical concept because our brain kind of optimize its resources right so to use this cognitive capacity uh like in a balanced way hence our brain most of the time try to take the easy road, right? So I always tell people like we are getting lazy and lazy by our nature, right? Instead of making rational decisions, now our brain kind of forced us to make satisfying decisions. What is satisfying, satisfying decisions? Decision makers take decisions convincing enough instead of utility maximization. So let's go back our examples of like washing machine or like, you know, if you like to buy a car, instead of looking all the benefits and costs involved for, to make the decision, what like, you know, makes you to make your decision is like, oh, okay, actually my cousin bought this washing machine and she was really happy. And that is enough because it's kind of enough evidence for you to make your decision. Or same goes for a car. It's a big purchase for you. I'm going to take some... Uh, you know, loan from the bank, but instead of just looking all the benefits again, you either say that I actually one of my colleagues at the office, so he has this car and he's really happy. Maybe I should buy this car. All right. So this is what we say, satisfying decision. Is it rational? Not fully though, right? Because 
your needs and your friend's needs or colleague's needs are not exactly the same, but you are easily influenced by this type of decisions because your brain doesn't want to take the you know, hard road and make all the calculations. Hence, in the behavioral economic concept, we have this famous book, Thinking Fast and Slow, by Daniel Kahneman. Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel uh, Prize in Economics with, with uh, his uh, late colleagues Amos Tversky in 2002. The fun fact is they are both psychologists, right? So, and they are psychology academics and they are doing so many experiments to understand uh, people purchase behavior, right? So what makes them to buy something over another, all right? So, and that hence they did like hundreds of experiments and there are so many other academics contributed to this field. And then they come up with so many new, new concepts, right? So we have nudging concept, reference pricing, anchoring, endowment effect, loss aversion. So some of those, I will cover them in my future videos, okay? So please tune in and to my channel and subscribe to my channel if you'd like to learn more about those in different contexts. And then we also have Tyler, Richard Tyler, with his famous book, Nudge, and he also won another uh, uh, economic uh, Nobel Prize. And then he also introduced those, some of those concepts, especially nudging is like a you know, famous concept uh, by, by Richard Tyler. And overall, by what they say is actually, we can, affect people's behavior by giving them certain choices, right? So, and there is also another concept called choice architecture, right? So you can actually uh, decide what to show them, right? So give them different options, and then you can also, you know, uh, guess which one will they choose or not, all right? So this is really good kind of the power that we can have. And so in the, for the, another concept is mental accounting, uh, they say same price, but prefer to pay with credit card. Why? Even if it's the same price, we like to postpone our payment, even if it doesn't make uh, any sense in most of the cases, but because of pain of paying that we have here, we don't want to lose money. It's just kind of that we are losing something that belongs to us. It's kind of like belonging. Even if you know that you are going to spend that money one way or another, but paying with credit card like makes you feel more comfortable. Uh, it makes you feel like you are not paying something, right? So it's not rational decision, but it is the way it is, right? And those are so many other examples that we are gonna cover. Some of them are really interesting that like we see every day, like resistance to change, or we call it statistical bias. So we always uh, prefer the uh, the things uh, uh, in the way that, that they are, right? So, and there was like a huge failure example uh, like famous one, the Neve Koch example, even if in the field test, they found out that Neve Koch tastes better than old Coke formula, but when they hit the lunch with the, uh, when they hit the shelf with the new product lunch, people still prefer the old Coke, right? Because they preferred the, the old way. They, they were resistant to change, all right? So, so many of those things were explained by uh, the prospect theory contributors, and we are going to cover them in our upcoming videos as well. But in a nutshell, they say, as the title of the book uh, also uh, states that we have fast thinking and slow thinking, or system one and system two. System one is our intuitive thinking, instinctive thinking, and it's 95% of our thinking, right? It's almost always on, right? You don't need to activate it. Whenever you see something, the answer comes to your mind, all right? So that is system one. System two is rational thinking. You should activate them. When system one is not enough to make a decision, then system two comes into place, all right? So it takes effort, it needs more uh, time, and also it needs more information, all right? So let me give you one simple example. Just look at this picture on the screen, okay? So if I ask you who wears the glasses and who wears the uh, hat, so what would you tell me? Is there any answer comes to your mind directly, immediately? Or do you need more time? Or maybe you come closer to screen, right? And then to look more for more information. It is tricky, right? So, I mean, then you can actually infer something by looking at their bodies and say that, okay, our baby's body is actually towards us. And then then baby should, uh, should wear the, the hat and then glasses, right? And that is the answer, but you cannot tell it because of the way of the, like, you know, the nose, how nose is positioned, daddy's nose over there. And you feel like actually the cheek of the baby is part of the daddy's face and it confuses you. And hence, you need to activate your system too. 
all right and this is like a, one of the old examples old old ads uh, from Volkswagen and they say one angle is not enough right so sometimes you need more information so let me give you another one so if you look at this the screenshot from a website that I got so if I ask you which brand website is this quickly what is the first answer comes to your mind all right so don't think much when you see this what is the answer comes to your mind? Which brands comes to your mind? Please just share it with me uh, in, the, in the comment section because even if you don't see anything directly related to brand, we don't have a brand logo, we don't have a brand name, it is almost impossible for you to guess, but your brain, again, has an answer for this. How is it possible, right? So this is just a random website. It can be a random website. Maybe your answer is, Correct. Maybe it is not, by the way, because it depends what are the recent exposures you got in terms of website. If you spend uh, recently spent so much time on a certain uh, website that you might think that, ah, oh, this is a screen graph from them. OK, they all look similar. But when, when I do this in my classes at university, most of the time, almost like 95 percent of the time, students got this right immediately. Right. So, and immediately they said H&M. And it's correct. This is from H&M website. But what amazes me all the time, even if there is no straight clue about the brand, no logo, no name, students can answer this correctly because they know that they like they know the design of the website without knowing they know it right and this is why we have this in our textbook mother's book textbook 2023 i am one of the co-authors of this as well as you remember and we have this schemas right so schematic memory or knowledge structure so when you have a brand in your mind it's not only the product or services they uh, serve to you or they give to you, but all the other things, right? So their color, their you know, branding, packaging, their advertising. So what type of music they use, right? So that all part of your schema about this brand. Same goes for the H&M example that we have. When you spend time without you even realize that your brain is actually make the design of the website as a part of the schematic memory. OK, so and the next time you see it, it immediately link it back to brand. It said that, oh, OK, so this is the website design of H&M. So that connection is already there. It is triggered without you even realize. So that is the beauty of system one. But just be careful. System one answers are not always correct. Like I said, sometimes you might think that this is Zara's website or I don't know, Mongo's website based on your recent exposure maybe that linkage is not correct all right so in your mind but this is really really you know good way of understanding system one and system two because we might be wrong we might sometimes not understand the things uh in the way they are right because we fail to comprehend something and it is not a big problem so roger shepherd in 1990s he said that you should value uh, the those type of mistakes that our brain making, our, our brain is making, right? So if you look at those two tables, for example, A and B, if I ask you which one is longer, right? So vertically, which one is taller? If I ask you, so probably something that will come to you like directly, right? So even if I teach this so many times, whenever I look at them, I still say that like A must be longer, right? So A must be longer. But if I tell you they are exactly the same size, would you believe me, right? Of course you should believe me because I'm not making things up, but to to, to convince you uh, even more because it is always hard for me to understand this, let me show you a video, okay? So how they are exactly the same size. You're gonna need proof for this, but so, you can easily draw this just too. look at the transition. The proof cutout is exactly the same dimensions as the so tabletop. It's exactly the same, all right? So let's, let's watch it again. So that transition, the kind of, lose the sense of depth, right? So we don't understand the depth that quickly. And probably you know that the, the famous, uh, the, the historians and science historians, maybe we can, we can call him, you all know Harari in, in one of his books, he said that in the evolution of mind and brain connection, that connection kind of, you know, didn't complete its evolution. Hence our brain cannot comprehend this type of depth or, uh, quick hand movement, etc. So we call them illusion. But it also gives us a clue that our brain cannot be fully rational, even if we want it to be. All right. And that it affects our purchase decisions. 
So this is the just introduction for behavioral economics. So thank you for watching. If you enjoy this content, please subscribe to my channel and make sure that you also watch other content that I'm sharing daily. Thank you and see you in the next videos. Bye.